Hello, welcome. I am excited to be in conversation today with uh, uh, Andrew Davison. Uh, Dr. Andrew Davison is the Starbridge Professor in Theology and Natural Sciences at University of Cambridge, has been since 2014. He's also a, a fellow of Corpus Christi College, where he's the dean of the chapel there. Uh, prior to his career in theology, uh, Dr. Davison had a career in uh, natural science as a chemist and biochemist. Uh, he is currently serving as the, uh, uh, for it, during the, this academic year and the following, the distinguished uh, a visiting fellow in science and theology at the Center of Theological Inquiry at Princeton. Uh, University. Uh, Dr. Davison is uh, a the author of many, many books. I grabbed just a couple that were on my shelf here uh, to, for a little show and tell. This um, always will be one of my favorites, this uh, lovely little introduction to, uh, the, the, to philosophy for theologians called The Love of Wisdom, which uh, he once described to me as something like a theological biography of Plato's forms. Uh, and it really is, and it's lovely. And then this one, which came out just a few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, Participation in God, which I tell as many people as I can that they need to read it and it will change their life and uh, that I would love to talk about it with them when they do. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for being part of uh, this conversation with me. Well, it's great to be on a podcast with you. And I can say I'm as enthusiastic about your work as you just so kindly have been about mine. Oh, that's very kind. Well, I would like to talk about uh, the newest uh, book that you've got out, which uh, I have not yet seen, as I and as I understand it, you haven't yet seen either, uh, although you've seen it plenty of times on your computer screen and, and in your imagination. Uh, this is a work on astrobiology and Christian doctrine. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so it's out in Europe already, but it's not out in the United States, which is where I am at the moment until September. So frustratingly, I see it on Twitter in the hands of other people, but I haven't got a copy myself. Um, well, it's one of those books, um, I suppose, like the book that you held up and the book I'm working on at the moment, that was underway when I had a very happy spell visiting the Seminary of the Southwest, where you are. So um, I remember doing a lecture for your theologians on the significance of life beyond Earth. And it is really with teaching that that story begins with me, for me. I was putting together a course on theology and science when I arrived in my position in, in Cambridge, a third year paper, and I wanted it to be specific. I wanted it to be about specific science and contemporary science, and not just about the idea of theology and science in, in general. So I put together a set of basically themes in contemporary biology that I thought would be of interest to the students and would provoke them to some theological thinking. And I ended it with the significance and the challenges and the provocations of life beyond earth, because I thought it would go down well in the classroom and it has done, and it has done also in public lectures. So there just seems to be quite an appetite out there for the topic. So that's one reason why I wrote on it. But also one of the really most significant scientific breakthroughs of the last 30 or 40 years has been finding that there are lots of planets out there. So until a colleague of mine in Cambridge, Didier Kahlo, uh, discovered the first planet around a sun-like star, we weren't absolutely sure that there were going to be very many. There were two models for the formation of solar systems. One would give you solar systems unbelievably rarely, and the other would probably throw them up at least some of the time. And it turns out that second model, which in fact Immanuel Kant had a hand in, um, uh, was right. And uh, I think even the people who were expecting that there would be other planets out there have been somewhat taken aback by just how common they turn out to be. Yeah. And with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're in a really good position now to be able to observe the atmosphere of those planets under the stars, which should give us, if there is life, sort of tell telltale indications from the balance of gases in the atmosphere. So I feel like we're poised for finding out or being able to investigate anyway, whether there's life beyond Earth and not just intelligent life, which is what we're gonna to have to wait for, but even if it's just algae or bacteria, we should be able to see it in the balance of gases. So it feels like a good time to be getting ready um, to be encouraging people to ask what if questions. And I think the majority of the world's people, we sometimes think about the secularization of the West, but 
The majority of people in the world, if there was evidence of life beyond Earth, would look to religious traditions for their bearings about what that means for them and their value and their place in the universe. So I think there's everything to be said for thinking theologically about the implications of life beyond Earth. So that if we open the newspaper, in fact, we probably wouldn't even need to open the newspaper because it would be on the front page. If there's evidence of life beyond Earth. We won't be starting from, um, you know, from no speed at all. So that, that's the that's uh, that's the um, story of how I got writing it, and and actually also being in the Central Theological Inquiry where I am now in Princeton. I was here six and six and seven years ago um, on a scheme that was partly funded by NASA to think about the implications of life beyond Earth, and so I have this wonderful nine month period to get into the literature and think about it and start writing. And then the pandemic and responsibilities in Cambridge has taken longer to finish the book than I expected, but it is at least now um, on the shelves in at least part of the world. You know that most theologians don't get mail from NASA, right? Well, it was mediated. So the money came to the Centre in Cambridge and then, uh, sorry, in Princeton, and they um, they employed people. But um, it's been, it was a, a fantastic opportunity because we had all these wonderful scientists come to talk to us and um, it really gave me the opportunity to get into this that I think I would, it would have taken a lot longer without it. And this and that, what really surprised me, if I might say, about reading that history was just how long theologians have been thinking about life beyond Earth. So we get the impression that somehow theology has had to be dragged kicking and screaming into thinking about these things by contemporary science. But it's been a topic of conversation of writing amongst Christian theologians since about the middle of the 15th century. I could think of two theologians of the 15th century who think about the implications of something like you know, biological life beyond Earth. And then really it's thought about continuously since then. And if anything, the frustrating thing is that people just are so unworried about it that they write a few lines and move on. Mm. So there's, there's centuries and centuries of writing about this. Uh, it's just that no one's quite perturbed enough or for a few people are perturbed enough. Uh, to, to really want to write, um, you know, 400 pages rather than just one. Well, you said um, that you imagine if that, you know, if we, if the search for extraterrestrial life turns up, you know, suddenly one day on the front page of the newspaper, it, you know, we found it, that you imagine that um, people will be turning to religious traditions to get their bearings. Um, as you're, as you're, in the in the research in the writing of this project, uh, what's maybe an example of something you discovered that you thought this is this is a question here or this is a thought here that might help Christians especially uh, get their bearings uh, in relation to the discovery of life elsewhere in the universe? Well, I've taken an approach with the book, which is I suppose quite straightforward, of just working my way through the main topics in Christian systematic theology creation, sin, salvation, Christology, eschatology, that sort of thing. Um, and I'd have to say, I don't want to put people off um, from buying the book, uh, but it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think that there are enormous red flags. I and mean, I, don't, I, I don't think that there are um, things that uh, Christians uh, can't take in their stride, although I think here and there, there are real um, provocations. So for instance, um, over Christology, you know, do we think that there's only one incarnation, which is at the one that's happened on Earth, or do we think that that's the way in which God would deal with, you know, a, a species that was um, so you know rational and capable of of love and memory and so on, um, you know, more generally? And so there's quite a large proportion, and the, the largest proportion of the book is dedicated to that. So I think that's a fascinating topic. Um, in yeah, terms I'm... of helping us bearings, I think the doctrine of creation is really important. Um, and the idea that the world is just is characterized by multiplicity because you know God is plenitude and the world is finite. And the way in which the world makes the best reflection it can of the splendor and plenitude of God is through variety and multiplicity. So it's a great tradition, it's quite a Christian Platonist tradition, but it's it's pretty much you know there throughout Christian history. And if you at all belong to that way of looking at things, then there's absolutely no problem with there being lots of life out there and lots of creatures and lots of marvelous things. Because in a way, that's what you'd expect. Yeah, yeah it strikes me that the um, just from those two examples that 
um, while there, you know, while, while, as you said, there are no real red flags, there are some provocations. It strikes me that um, in some ways the doctrine of creation is easier. You know, your doctrine of creation just gets easier, but your Christology, now it like it something something new is happening in Christology in a way that it maybe isn't quite happening um in um in in doctrine of creation and i that that seems really rich i'm um thinking about like like uh when we talk you know the 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 work of the holy spirit it centers around the per the incarnation the person of christ so like in the new testament what the spirit is doing is it's helping people to see you know who who, G who jesus is or or afterwards right you know you know, the, the, the spirit is at work in the proclamation of this story of the one who dwelt with us. And it seems like that too would have to, that's connected to this question of, does the spirit work, does the spirit work in the same way if you're talking about a, a world apart from ours in which beings are very different, in which there is no knowledge of you know the 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 no no knowledge of Torah and you know the incarnate one and all of this. Mm. Um, that seems like some really rich. I think I would say at that point there are a couple of chapters on Revelation that it would be similar but in a different way, or different but in a similar way. By which I mean, um, in in Revelation is speaking to us. There's this very well trodden path of saying that God is accommodated to human capacities. Yes. And not and, and to our histories and our and our bodies and our forms of life and our uh, the way our language works and so on. And God is the consummate communicator who speaks in a way in which it can be received. So it seems to me there are a couple of points throughout the book where you can say, well, I don't know what the detail will be like, but the principle by which it operates will be the same. And because the principle by which it operates is the same, the detail will be different. So because God is the great communicator and communicates in a way that um, accords to our mode of being and form of life and so on, if the mode of life, uh, form of life is different, the revelation will, will meet it there. So it will be different, but according to the same principles. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way in which I would approach the incarnation too. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that the one incarnation in Jesus Christ does everything that needs to be done. But I'd say that there's more than just doing some kind of minimal or necessary thing in the incarnation. There's also the fact that God comes to us and we meet him face to face. And it's this intimacy of, of God taking on our nature. So my hunch, and it's no more than that, and I'll let God do the right thing, obviously, um, would be that there's something equivalent to that drawing near in one's very nature elsewhere but that there's a wonderful poem by Alice Maynell, Maynell, Alice Maynell where she considers creatures comparing notes about how God has dealt wonderfully with them in the life of the world to come and um, so I know we just have to wait till that I suppose um, but uh, it's a great poem it's called Christ in the Universe and it's a it's a really nice way into this topic. That's fantastic. Um, since the book came out you have uh, continued to work in this area and you're working at uh, a, a new um, institute, uh, isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so I'll say one last thing about the book, which is that I think even if we never find evidence of life beyond Earth, either because there isn't any or just because it's you know, quite rare. And I mean, even if, even if there was uh, only one in a billion planets that could have it, have it, uh, had life, there still will be billions of examples in the observable universe, but it just might take us a long time to find them. But say we don't find any evidence, I still think it's a great exercise to look at old questions from new angles, and I—that's one of the ways in which I think it makes for really good, a uh, really good theme in teaching theology. It encourages people to come at topics kind of obliquely. Yeah. Um, so I've enjoyed it for that reason. It's been a kind of uh, mental workout, you know, to think about these things from new angles. But yes, there's this wonderful new centre in Cambridge, the Leverhulme Centre for Life in the Universe, which is a collaboration between. Maybe I mean, it start off with a dozen scientists, and then they heard that there was someone working in this area in arts and humanities, and so I got involved and we put a, a grant into this wonderful charity, the Leverhulme Trust, and they're funding the centre for 10 years, very generously, uh, and now there's a collaboration with uh, Harvard and Chicago, there are other um, universities involved as well, as, as well as CTI where I am in Princeton at the moment, 
Um, and that's uh, very much focused on the origins of life. So absolutely not on intelligent life. I mean, even by the time something's big enough to wiggle and crawl around, that's, you know, they can leave it to the biologists at that point. Uh, it's really about this transition from non-living matter into living matter. And it's fantastic to be working with scientists. I mean, I, I personally, I feel it's just such joy in that because it's getting me back into old haunts and ways of thinking and my you know, scientific uh, past. But I think it's wonderful, a real testament to the generosity of spirit of these scientists, but also the, just how interdisciplinary the university can be, that they've taken this theologian with philosophical interests, you know, right to their heart, I think, and um, very happy for me to organize workshops and you know, try and bring all sorts of people from the arts and humanities in. And I sense actually that this is what this center perhaps from some other, uh, um, some other work on the origins of life. Yeah, I was thinking I could imagine those, in certain contexts, those being really difficult conversations or just conversations that can't get off the ground. If uh, if you've got scientists who are asking particular kinds of questions, then, um, you know, a, a theologian, a philosopher, it's almost just a different language that they're speaking. But it sounds like you all have found a way to to sort of invite one another into those into those disciplines. I think I've been very fortunate with my colleagues and there's a sense of course in which you don't need everybody to be equally enthusiastic you just need a handful of people to um to have conversations with and I've certainly got uh, got that um but I it, when putting the grant together we were quite you know I think we were quite creative and um a bit um yeah imaginative really in saying that the easy way to cast this would be that the theologians, the arts and humanities people, philosophers, they're going to listen to the scientists, the scientists will tell them what's what, mm. and then they'll go and their arts and humanities thoughts about it. And I'm perfectly happy, you know, I do that, I'm perfectly happy with that. But I also thought it was useful and provocative to say, we want the dialogue to flow in both directions and the exchange to flow in both directions. And that sometimes it could be the arts and humanities people who've got insights about how to think about life or matter or a process or an origin that maybe helps us every now and again helps the scientists come at their questions in a new way and if and if that happened even a few times over the life of the center i think that will be tremendously useful and and a, a really good example of, of a properly cross disciplinary you know both directions conversation yeah that's fantastic um reminding me of um, some of my uh, favorite science fiction where they sort of, uh, you, you sort of get the sense that uh, the big questions in science, some, like I'm thinking about the, um, the, uh, the, the, the three body problem with the, the second book was about the dark forest. And you sort of, you, you, you're, you know, everyone's trying to, trying to imagine how do we think about the world beyond us? And then this metaphor becomes the sort of the, the dominant thing that they begin to it begins to sort of help us see what might be out there is this uh, metaphor of the forest and i can imagine that that's a place where um humanities folks in in particular might be able to sort of hear what the scientists are saying and then sort of try out analogies or try out metaphors and maybe that opens up some new new pathways for for conversation well my instincts track i suppose in the philosophical direction and I think it's really important that we get literary angles in as well. Um, so maybe I should draw you into the conversation. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, although I, I, uh, I, I have to admit that one, um, that was a very exciting trilogy that sort of, for me, sort of piddled out at the end. It was, it was uh, it promised more up front than it did at the end, but uh, fascinating sort of just wrestling with that, the sort of big questions of, oh, if we, if there is life out there, it it doesn't just change sort of the science. It changes everything. It changes how we think about who we are, and it thinks about how we think about meaning. Um, so it's wonderful to sort of. I think I would say on that front, that, sorry, that people really divide um, into those who are naturally perturbed or threatened by the idea that there's hmm. other stuff, um, and those who who just think the more the merrier. And I I'm very much in the latter category um but it's one of the things i talk about in the book there's a couple of chapters on questions of uniqueness and the image of god and that sort of thing and asking is the image of god competitive 
does the image of God uh, rest in being different from other things, or is it more just objectively what you are? So I would say I'm no less than the image of God just because it turns out that some other creature is. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's I think in, in in terms of the bearing of this upon how one feels one's place in the world. Uh, actually, that's that is one of the most impactful aspects and i would certainly want to make a case for saying nothing about what it means to be human is any less wonderful if there are other examples of life and even intelligent life out there the more images of god the merrier yeah i love it i think it it belongs to the idea of an image that it can be multiply realized you know likeness against the backdrop of difference um you know there were lots of paintings of the late queen and they didn't compete with one another because they were images of her. And I think that, and I know we're using the image of God in a certain technical theological sense, but in as much as it is an image, I think something like that um, dynamic would apply to it. And that seems like such a, a oh, I know, just a, a, a sort of a, a, a font for contemplations in the in the early writings uh, uh, in, in the early days of Christian theology. You've got um, the early um, the church fathers who are fascinated with this. The sort of the where the finite and the inf- where the, that the finite can be an image of the infinite, and the appropriate way for the finite to image the infinite is sort of endlessly. Uh, and so, the in in that sense, it, you know, it's not that like if you pile up enough images of God, if you pile up enough images of God, you'll know what God looks like. But the more images of God yeah. you have, the more the sort of the fuller your sense of what God's infinity might actually might actually mean, what it might mean for God to be without end. And an image of God in the in the movement of things and in the the potential of things to kind of always exceed themselves, um, is, it really interests me as well. You've uh, uh, changed in the subject just for a moment. You have um, some of our, uh, for me, the sort of the most fun conversations we've had over the years. Um, along with, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean for Christology if there's life out there somewhere? That's a that's a fun conversation we've had before. But um, also, just this conversation about um, about uh, Christian doctrine and how um, the the ideas of Christian theology sort of become a kind of have a sort of web effect where you can move from one to the other. And this has been um, our, those conversations have been really helpful in my own teaching. And I think you are. This is this is a project that you're now. Uh, in some ways, you've been doing it all along as you've sort of done sort of theological, you know, like this book, Participation in God, is about you, you're sort of laying out the network of doctrines and you're doing that in the Astrobiology book too. But you're doing, you're doing it now, I think, in a way that just sort of takes on that question and focuses on that question. How do these, how do these teachings relate to one another? Mm. Well, this is another thing that I've you know, tried out at the seminary uh, and, and you let me... Um, you know, talk through with students of yours, and um, yeah, so I think it's turned out to be, for me, quite a well-trodden path and, and a useful model to take a theme and work it through doctrine, so that I wrote a book on what it means to bless things and people and then places and so on, and I just worked through doctrines and uh, the same with the participation book and the astrobiology book, but with this one, I'm saying, well, just what about doctrine itself? How do all the doctrines relate to one another? And it's just, and I'll put it as simply as this, it just seems to me that quite a lot of the fun and the fascination in systematic theology is in the relation of doctrines. Um, sort of the splendor and the beauty of it and the sort of um, the artistry of what we're talking about comes in the way in which one thing is re- reflected in another. So the challenge was how to turn what would make you know, an interesting kind of floor chart into, um, into a book, by which I mean, I gathered over the 10 years or whatever, lots of, of what I thought were really fascinating examples of theologians writing about the relation of doctrines. And you could make a chart of you know, all the doctrines down one side and all the doctrines down the other, and, uh, and, and it would be huge, you know, as I say, to make the floor. Um, but how to turn those into a book was a bit uh, daunting. So thanks to this um, study leave that I've got at the Central Theological Inquiry at the moment, I thought, well, I'm going to do what I probably would never have headspace for if I was having to teach and administer and so on and see if I can spin a book out of it. And it was also a treat, I suppose, you know, uh, I had this these two years, well, the first one, one of the things that I would do is to look at something that I'd um, 
long wanted to consider, which is how doctrines relate to one another. So, yeah, it's about how the commitment that you might have in one place leads to repercussions elsewhere, and just about, about how it joins up. And also, I think, about trying to encourage readers to be comfortable inhabiting the spaces between doctrines. So um, I think quite a lot of the practical questions that you might be asked to address as a minister of some sort, they're not just in the orbit of one particular doctrine, they, they lie between them. And I like the idea that this, this multiplies the number of resources that we have. So um, if you're at a bedside of a sick person or, or even a graveside, say, that's, you don't just have eschatology to draw upon there, you've got everything. And preparing people for marriage, you haven't just got one sort of sacramental theology to, to draw upon. Um, and it, so being comfortable in these areas and how doctrines join up, I think sort of, it means that everything in the faith, or at least a lot of it, bears upon every question. And I think as a pastor, as a priest myself, I find that really uh, useful. That's fantastic. I, yeah, I'm so as you're talking, I'm thinking about like, um uh you know ideas that are, uh, ideas or images or ways of talking about something within the christian faith that is important to someone and everyone's got those uh everyone's got like this is this is an idea that's been really important to me i'm hanging on to this this is sort of the center of my faith um and part of what you're doing it seems like is showing the way that 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 doesn't just sort of stay put in one particular sort of compartment of their faith but actually that can change the way you think about you know, eschatology can think it can change the way that you think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. It can, you know, it can th that that idea sort of can lead you into new into new uh, pathways that will be equally exciting once you sort of begin to note the connection. That feels like an important. I think that mention there of Mary is actually is that mention of Mary is really helpful because um, I think it's also fine for different connections to mean more for different sorts of people and for different traditions. And so if you take the example of reformed theology, for instance, it's historically done a lot of work with the idea of the covenant. So the way in which more than one covenant, in fact, bears upon all the other doctrines, that's been a really important way in. Now that can be perhaps overdone, but it's 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 good, it's legitimate, it's it's fruitful. Um, and especially if you haven't come across that idea before, seeing how everything might hang together around the idea of covenant is really useful. And similarly, um, the, the person of Mary and her role in the history of salvation, there's a way in which Roman Catholic theology, Orthodox theology, certain sorts of Anglican theology, have explored everything in the whole map of Christian theology through the figure of Mary. And again, probably that could be done in a way that became lopsided or something like that. But it's it's a legitimate thing to do. It's 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 fascinating, and it means a lot to a lot of people. And if you're not of that tradition, then seeing how everything might be joined together through her is also a useful thing to do. So I think it's, it's a really useful comment that you make there that um, that it's it's actually quite characteristic of different theological traditions that um, they hang together in various different ways. Yeah, yeah. This is a uh, so, you know there probably not one, but there are sometimes a, a few limited sort of centers that everything else sort of networks through. And yeah, as you're saying, the traditions name those differently. Um, relate One final question for you. This related, I think related to this topic. Um, you are, I mentioned at the, at the top that you are um, a, a, a dean of the chapel there at Corpus Christi. Uh, and you've been ordained for almost 20 years now, I think. Something like that. Yeah, 20 years as a deacon, and um, I'm starting to think about uh, next July the 4th, in fact, um, when it's going to be 20, 20 years as a priest. Priest, okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of uh, extending this question about what uh, the, the, the uh, theological ideas that, that, that animate folks. Um, and I wonder if in your, uh, in your ministry, in your traveling around uh, churches in the US, or in the UK or in the world, if you have, if you've gotten a sense of um, what seems to matter theologically, maybe not not so much to the to the scholars and the you know in the, in the classrooms, but in the churches and among the people of among the lay people and the people of faith. Hmm. So, what what sorts of theological questions they might might ask? What seem, what do they seem to be asking? 
I would say uh, that um, the lectionary is really important. So the fact that at least the churches that I tend to worship in um, or lead worship in follow a lectionary day by day and week by week. Put portions of the Bible are put in front of people and I think it's important to notice and celebrate how um, attentive people are to that. It really is a bedrock of their piety and they take seriously what they hear in church They and, and then so they ask questions. So I, I, I would point to the frequency with which people say, oh, you know, in the gospel reading today, um, I was thinking about it and um, and not not usually coming up with a you know kind of complete blankness, but by saying, well, it, it made me think of this, and you know, what do you think about that? So I think the uh, ongoing bouncing off the scriptures is part of the piety and uh, faith and questing of, of uh, people that I have to do with. Um, I think it's worth pointing out there as well that I think sometimes the idea would be the church is full of people who are wrapped by you know questions in a, in a sort of in a troubling sense they're sort of tortured by questions and i think that is not my experience people are full of things they want to talk about um and i don't think it's just because they're afraid to you know ask questions uh where they might be troubled but i, I think we should i think things have moved on perhaps uh from some decades ago when we might think that people were you know somehow as they tortured by these questions. I think it, it's really impressive how, especially maybe amongst the younger people, I mean, if you're a young person, you're going to church, you're going to church because you're enthusiastic about it and you're, and you're convinced. Um, so I'm just struck by how thoughtful and kind of joyful the questioning is of, um, of, of those people. Um, and then maybe the final thing I'd say on that front is just how often people want to talk about how theology, the faith, the practice of the faith, his Christian tradition and so on bears upon what also is, is, impor is important to them. So I was in church yesterday and I was talking to someone afterwards who has done just finished a degree in classics, um, ancient languages, and philosophy. And he was particularly interested in Plato and the way in which Plato had been received into Christianity and the new and interesting things that Christians and, and Jews and Muslims as well had done with Plato's thought. Uh, and I think I just come across that all the time, whether it's people who are engineers or they're scholars of foreign, foreign languages and literature. Um, there's just such an enthusiasm about joining up the parts of their lives that matter to them, their faith and these other things about which they can often be, you know, experts and their professional life. And their, their, it's, it's a lovely um, kind of integrative vision there, I think. Yeah, that's uh, I that that feels really exciting. Um just for the work that, you know, that, that we are doing is uh, noticing that kind of energy, noticing that there is an energy for that integration, um, that it's, that maybe we're not at a point right now where culturally, where uh, faith seems like a separate thing from the stuff that I care about in the rest of my life. And the, and the, sort of the evidence of that is just the sort of the curiosity and the energy that people bring to these questions when they, you know, when they like, maybe they're maybe it's part of the way they hear the gospel read, and they're like, "Oh, that reminds me of a conversation I had." You know, at the at the you know over over the engineers' drawing last week, um, and they don't even have to be sort of deep and penetrating analyses. It's just noticing those connections seems to, as you're saying, seems to sort of be one of the things, one of the one of the really exciting things that's happening in the in the life of people of faith right now. Hmm. Uh, Andrew, I really appreciate your time. I uh, appreciate the uh, conversation. I'm very, very excited about um, all the projects that you're doing, but uh, the, the newest and latest uh, that will be uh, showing up in the U.S. in September. That's when I plan to, to, to get my copy. Um, and uh, it's always fun to talk with you about uh, all things theological. And uh, thanks for sharing some time with us here today. Well, congratulations with this new website and these videos, and I look forward to following them. Thanks a lot, Andrew.